You're gonna be surprised by some of the eats we're trying. At Epcot's fanciest, fanciest Japanese, Japanese restaurant. restaurant. We are here at Takumi Tei. That is Epcot's Japan's most expensive restaurant. It is more expensive than Monsieur Paul, the very, very fancy restaurant over in the France Pavilion. Uh, Takumi Tei is Japanese for House of the Artisan. This spot is only open in the evenings, and right now it is only open for walk-in only on select days of the week. Takumi Tei brought fine signature dining to Epcot when it opened in 2019 and has been closed since the 2020 park closure. It only very recently reopened. Uh, the goal of this is to weave the beauty of Japan into the atmosphere and the menu. This restaurant is only open in the evenings from 5 to 7 30 p.m. on select nights and it is currently walk-in only though keep an eye on allears.net to see if that changes. The menus at this restaurant are omakase or leave it up to the chef in Japanese tasting menus uh, that are special gastronomical experiences. There is the kiku omnivorous course starting at $250 without tax and gratuity and the plant-based course the hasu course starting at $150 uh, without tax and gratuity. Both menus are designed to quote unquote, delight and surprise both connoisseurs and newcomers to Japanese cuisine. They also have signature cocktails, premium sake, wine, and craft beer. Now the check-in process is uh, pretty simple. They, it is walk-up only. There are no advanced dining reservations at this time. So they offer a limited number of walk-ups. We walked up to the check-in desk, which you can find in the far right on the France Pavilion on the bottom floor of the building. You walk right up to the desk, talk to the cast member there, and they will let you know if they have any space in the night. Tonight, I walked up right at 4.55 about, spoke to her that I wanted a table for two, and we were able to get a table for 5.15, so it wasn't too difficult at all. Heading into the restaurant, we were walked in by cast members here at Takumi Te, and we were greeted by cast members with a bow and brought to our table. We were seated in the stone room. Now there are five very beautiful rooms in this restaurant, each inspired by a natural element, water, wood, earth, stone, or washi paper. Every area features beautiful handcrafted works of art that honor the elements that brought those rooms to life, which is very beautiful. The space feels like a total escape as you walk in, and our table in the stone room was next to this beautiful stone zen garden that I got to look at behind Breed Love for the whole night. That was absolutely beautiful. And uh, once we were seated, we were greeted by our server and it was time to eat. <laughs> You look kind of like a floating head because of your turtleneck. <laughs> That's what I wanted. <laughs> we just finished at Takumi Tei. And it was A-OK -okay plus a million. This is Quincy and Brie Love from the future. We are doing our tasting notes now just because it's a class year experience. It's a little harder for us to talk between all those courses. Yes. So we're doing our tasting notes now out here in the boardwalk and uh, enjoy. Time for food. First thing I had was the Kami. Every time I said it, I said it wrong and she said it right after. I kept saying kami and she kept saying the kami. It's the kami cocktail and kami I think means something to do with paper because she explained that my cocktail did have a tiny paper crane on it for that reason, which I am obsessed with. Um, this was a lychee cocktail. It was made with gin, sake, and then lychee. Uh, lychee is one of my favorite things to have in an alcoholic drink. It is a fruit that is more often found in Asian cuisines and Asian drinks. It's kind of similar to like a berry and a pear mixed together a little bit. I had to get this as soon as I saw it on the menu. I absolutely love lychee martinis and that's pretty much what this was. It was a delight. It was super, um, it had those sweet flavors without being overly sweet. I couldn't taste the like woody qualities of gin, which is not my favorite thing about gin. I prefer like vodka and martinis, but I couldn't taste that at all. So it wasn't off-putting. It was very refreshing, a great way to kind of start the meal and something a little fun to start out with. Um, first course. Uh, there are two menus at yes. Takumi Tei. There is a plant-based menu and an omnivorous menu. Yes. Mine was called the Kiku, and yours was called the Hasu. And mine was $100 cheaper. Yeah, it yeah. was. Yeah, it was. And one course, <laughs> just one course shorter. And a yes. lot of meat shorter. Both of our menus, uh, his, the plant-based at $150, and mine, the Omakase Kiku omnivorous course at 250 were start began with the appetizer course the zinsai moriwase which is a chef selection of five seasonal appetizers for me and three for you yes this was the dumpling that i couldn't pick up with my chopsticks you used the stabbing method this is the one we shared in common yeah i just shredded mine basically um ultimately it was a soy kind of I don't know, almost a pudding. Yeah, or it was. A mousse? It was. There was tofu involved, but yeah. texturally, it was not like tofu. No, it was, it was like a pudding. It was, it was like, like a, a savory pudding. Like a savory pudding formed into 
a bun. Yeah, for sure. I enjoyed it. I think it was definitely one of the more texturally challenging things that was on that appetizer plate. Like it was certainly very, you know. Yeah. Oh, I definitely do. Yeah. I, I was I was shocked by the by the consistency. Pudding is the way to put it. It tasted yeah. like an English savory pudding. Yes, made out of tofu. Made out of tofu. But it had a little piece of gold leaf and a dollop <coughs> of wasabi. Wasabi. Yep. Yes, which was um great the one bite that I could get it on. We both had edamame. Yes. Which, um, it was edamame. It was served cool. I'd it had say a little salt on it. It wasn't hard no. the way that, um, like your more conventional run-of-the-mill edamame is when you have it, mm -hmm. uh, maybe at your local Japanese restaurant. <laughs> and there wasn't a ton of salt on the outside. Um, uh, you know, there was, it was just like seasoned perfectly. And I'm mm -hmm. not really sure. Maybe it was in, they they soaked them in salt water or something. That, I don't, yeah, it kind of Maybe had that because vibe. it had a saltiness to it, but nothing near when it's coated in the rock salt. Yep. How was your little salad on your appetizer plate? It was. It was good. It was a. It was a light, refreshing um, seaweed and cucumber salad. Um, it had two. <laughs> it had two little sprigs of of seaweed or or some kind of sea plant. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was very mild, but I could taste that it was seaweed. The other one was very seaweed forward, almost that kind of almost fishy flavor. Yeah. So um, good, light, refreshing. For me, my appetizer, my salad was similar, except that it was crab focused. It had a crab claw with all the great crab meat, crab meat in there from like crab legs. Um, it was very tasty. I will say this was a chilled salad. The crab was a little on the fishy side. It definitely had a fishy taste. So if that's like a massive turnoff for you, I think that this is going to be the start of the more challenging aspects of this meal. Um, but the crab meat itself was extremely tender and extremely well seasoned, which typically when I have crab, it's not seasoned. You just dunk it in butter. There was an uni course. Uni is sea urchin. And so the uni itself, extremely mushy and also gonna have uh, more of that fishy sort of surprising taste. Uh, if the term umami, which is something that talks about a lot with mushrooms and with seafood, is that kind of like funky flavor that you can get from fish, uni is a prime example of like an umami full dish. And this was very much like it had that sort of funk to it in a very pleasant way. My final dish on this plate was um, a little seaweed salad, very small serving with fish roe on it. Uh, looked just like Nemo's siblings, just like them. <clears throat> like a clownfish? I don't think they're clownfish. Like baby clownfish? This is good as well. It's definitely on the like salty briny side. And when those, those are fish eggs, and when they pop, they have like, tastes like fresh sea water in them. This meal is not for the picky eater, and we learned that immediately at the appetizer course, both of us did. Um, but the, uh, the seaweed was a little briny, it had that like ocean taste to it. And then the roe, when you bit into them, they were big enough that you could actually get the sensation of popping to them. And when they popped, they had, they tasted like seawater inside, um, which is sort of the appeal of fish roe. And I actually did enjoy this, despite the fact that I typically do find stuff like this a little more challenging. I just don't think I could have had more than the very small portion that was given to me on that plate. So I did enjoy it, um, but definitely the most challenging thing on the appetizer plate, even more than the sea urchin, in my opinion. Next up was our sushi course, our first sushi course. One of them had mushrooms on top, so it is sushi. It's all, it, it was almost like, um, this is the wrong, but like an Asian cacciatore sauce, but that's that idea of like when you cook mushrooms with wine and you cook it oh. down and it gets this like thick brown sauce that is both sweet and savory at the same time and really delicious. It had like that kind of flavor on a sushi roll. How cool is that? That's very cool. And then there was this red pepper. There was a red pepper roll. Well, first of all, the produce was like impeccable. So the flavor on its own was just like through the roof. It was like, tasted more like, like red bell pepper or whatever red pepper it was. It was red, bell, it was pepper. red bell pepper. Like it, it tasted more like red bell pepper than any red bell pepper I've ever <laughs> tasted in my life. Now I wish the, the final roll had the same effect, but it didn't. It was the um, it was the avocado roll that was wrapped in soy paper, and is that what you call it when you roll yeah. sushi in soy, yeah. soy paper? Yeah, it was soy paper, 
and it was just avocado and rice inside and um, it did not, it needed a sauce to it. Dip tasted it tasted like I just had avocado yeah, and rice inside. I, I did I did the wrong I did literally the opposite order uh, to what I should have. Speaking of sushi, I also had a sushi course. Mine had raw fish in it. Um, shockingly, not at all. Traditional. Traditional. Traditional, yes. we would call it. I eat a lot of sushi. I love sushi. I go a lot to Morimoto Asia's sushi bar at Disney Springs and I eat their sushi platters. I love the sushi there. I think it's very high quality. Uh, the sushi that I had tonight was the best sushi I've ever had. It was amazing. This sushi pl platter, platter, this sushi platter, this sushi platter was three pieces of nigiri and one sushi roll. The sushi roll, she just described it as a sushi roll. And it was, it looked like it had so much in it. Like we looked at it and it was like there was egg souffle in there. I saw fish roe, I saw fish, I saw vegetables. There was a lot going on. I ate the whole thing in one bite as you're supposed to do with sushi. And it tasted like I was eating like a whole meal in one bite. It was absolutely delicious. The other three tasted like impeccable cuts of fish. Um, first I had the yellowfin tuna. This one was extremely buttery. Yellowfin tuna is a very common sushi fish. It was extremely buttery, very easy to eat. Um, had a lot of really great flavor, but none of it being like fishy or like oceanic at all. It was just kind of like a buttery, fatty fish flavor, which was awesome. Um, all of the sushi rolls were already seasoned with soy sauce. And what I learned tonight is I think I'm over seasoning my sushi when I go, because there was not a lot of soy sauce on any of these. And I thought it tasted better than any sushi I've had which is probably also a testament to the craftsmanship and the fish. My second roll was, um, or my second nigiri was a scallop nigiri, which I have never had scallop nigiri, and I really love scallops, but not I don't often eat scallops raw. And I was really surprised by the flavor of this one. I went through like a series of emotions on my face because the flavor of the scallop actually had an almost citrusy vibe to it, which paired super well with the wasabi that was in the um, nigiri already binding it. Um, I absolutely love this one, but my favorite was the eel. The eel was my final, bite of nigiri and eel might be something that sounds kind of off-putting but as someone who does get kind of averse to like stranger textures um i have always found eel to be surprisingly like hearty it almost has a meatier texture than most fish which i didn't expect i expected it to be like gooey because eels you know but i absolutely love the eel it had an amazing flavor to it an amazing texture um all three of these pieces of nigiri were unbelievable just unbelievably high quality fish simple ingredients amazing quality next course again i was surprised and i kept having to ask questions about my food all right so you've got these kind of flat square pieces of tofu and they are fried and for whatever reason the the flavor and texture combination they were giving me was that of French toast. There was something caramelized about it. <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, riding piggyback on them were these fried lotus root slices. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was really delicious, and I loved that there was, like, extreme crunch along with the fried tofu, so it was, like, fried and crunchy and salty and, and delicious. My course was the agemono course. Um, which for me was lobster tempura served with a creamy ponzu sauce and a, it's on the menu with matcha salt, but it was actually a yuzu salt tonight. They swapped the salt out to try to keep the menu a little fresher. It was matcha salt last week, yuzu salt this week. And it's handmade, homemade. It is homemade. House made. House made yuzu salt. yuzu salt. So with the agamono course, I had the lobster tempura here, which was, tempura is like a lighter fry, which I'm not a huge fried food person and like heavier batters do tend to make me sick. So I like tempura a lot, but tempura wow. fried food can get a little oily. And this certainly was, it was amazingly cooked lobster. I call this the fanciest fish sticks you've ever had in your life. It's exactly what it was. It was a fancy, fancy fish stick. Amazingly cooked lobster that was super tender and super buttery. But this was a really great course. It was definitely one of the heavier courses, but I still really, really enjoyed it despite not liking heavier foods like that. Um, I also thought it was the perfect portion. You got two hefty pieces of this tempura lobster. Um, so I was a fan of that course too. The Yuba roll was when I tasted flowers. Do you remember that? That was a beautiful time. It was a really beautiful time during our meal. There was also daikon in it. Yeah. Okay, there was a little piece of daikon on the side. I will say that this was like not salty. Um, this was um, sort of on the blander side. Um, and it had a bit of a floral sort of essence that mm -hmm. you found kind of lingering 
in your nose and that isn't going to be for everybody. It was a very green tasting roll. Yeah, a lot of things that I, I had uh, were, were super green. My favorite course of the meal, Yeah. the sashimi course. Yeah. It was amazing. It was unbelievable. It was the best raw fish I've ever had and I ate a good amount of raw fish. This was three cuts of sashimi. There was snapper, was the lighter one with the skin. There was fatty tuna, which is the one that looks the reddest. And there was yellowfin tuna. The snapper was the first one I tried. Uh, this one about landed back in buttery fish land. Super buttery texture, super buttery flavor. Um, just a killer piece of fish. And the skin on it wasn't overly chewy, which I was really impressed by because it looked like it was gonna be super chewy. No fishiness at all. Pairs perfectly with the wasabi. I love wasabi and wasabi on there. Just, mm. even, I obviously ate the skin, part of the skin was on it, and the skin was not really oh. chewy either. Definitely a little chewier than the fish meat, but Wonderful. not really chewy. Um, the fatty tuna was amazing. This was a super fatty piece of fish. I, as soon as I tasted this, it had the richness level of a dessert while being savory and fish, if that makes sense. It was very heavy in your mouth. The flavor was super rich and fatty, just like you would expect from something called fatty tuna. And this had a couple little pieces of caviar on it. So luxury. And then my final one was the yellowfin tuna, which though a little bit uh, tougher and not tough by any means, but just a little more resistance when you bite into it than the fatty tuna had the same great flavor. A lot of like big bursting fish flavors without being fishy, if that makes sense. So this course, shocked me to my core. I, I literally told Brie Lowe, I was like, hey, can you save me one of your Uber rolls just in case the texture is a little much for me and I need to have something a little more solid after I try these fish. Well, finally, I got my tempura and boy, was it worth the wait. Let me tell you, I had pumpkin, I had leek, Leak. I had three different kinds of really primo, beautiful mushrooms, like giant clusters of mushrooms and I had let's see did I have anything else other than that leek leek pumpkin right the pumpkin yeah was there the was first pumpkin thing. pumpkin three different kinds of mushroom wasn't there an onion or was that the leek there wasn't an onion okay lots and we of mushrooms we thought there was going to be ginger but that was there, a yeah. misunderstanding yeah but it was listen I, I couldn't believe it. it was like for to have like for all vegetable tempura to be like that premium of like delicious beautiful interesting kinds of vegetables three of them being mushroom which i understand because that's a hearty you know beautiful vegetable that Often tastes a meat substitute tastes meaty mm -hmm. that you know oh my gosh the best temper i've ever had in my life that yuzu salt um next up was um my main course which was the yakimono course um, I had a choice for this. I could either have uh, the Wagyu, the duck, or the Chilean sea bass. Now, I don't like duck, so I asked our server if I should do the Wagyu or the Chilean sea bass. I am a huge fan of Chilean sea bass, but when one has the opportunity to eat one of the best steaks in the world, it's kind of hard to pass that up, so I could not decide. She told me to go with the Wagyu, and I am glad she did. I typically would prefer the Chilean sea bass. However, at this point in the meal, I was a little fished out. Had a lot of fish by this point. So that Wagyu was a really nice way to actually get something, you know, red meat that isn't fish and seafood and sea, like urchin and lobster and crustacean. But I did get the Wagyu. My Wagyu was um, beautiful. I had it cooked medium rare because that's why I like steak. This was A5 Wagyu. It's an extremely expensive, high quality cut of meat from Japan. Um, it is a marbled fat. So if you actually look at it, you can see the marbled lines of fat through it. And what that does is it changes the quality of the fat, but the, the steak was obviously beautiful. It was Wagyu cooked by extremely talented chefs, very tender. It was served on with two different sauces, a black sesame sauce, which tasted kind of like everything bagel seasoning is the, is that's made with black sesame. So if you've had that, that's what it tasted like with a little hint of sweetness, complimented the steak very nicely, but there was also a leek sauce and that had a little sweetness to it as well, but it also had the sharpness that you expect from onion. I had a mixed <laughs> mushroom that had a lot of different mushrooms to it. It was very, very tasty. Um, just pretty simple, but well-cooked mushrooms um, and a bunch of quality ingredient mushrooms. Uh, then there were these little half potatoes. I made Breed Love try one because they had a surprising flavor. Maple syrup. 
Mm. I mean, that's the effect it has. Mm -hmm. I am so relieved to finally have Quincy get something that tastes wild that she has to ask me to confirm. These ones tasted like maple syrup a little bit. I couldn't identify it, but Brie Love put, put the nickel I was, on the nose. I was finding interesting similarities to Everywhere. many foods. Tonight. Many foods. Coca Cola. <laughs> it was a journey. Um, and then to supplement this course, I did have my one extra course. So he had six courses, I had seven. My one extra course is a seasonal broth. Um, in the Shirumono course, which tonight was a miso soup, um, which was delicious. Had tofu in it, it had more of those enoki mushrooms, scallions, um, and it was just a classic miso, very warm, very comforting, and a great way to help kind of digest the very heavy wagyu that I had just eaten before going on to dessert. The really fun note is that this had a little bit of ginger flavor to it. It had a little bit of spiciness from some ginger, which I don't typically taste in miso soup. Um, made it very tasty as well. All right, our final course, the dessert course, Ocha To Con Mi. Ocha To Con Mi was our final course. It is the dessert course. It was a green tea and dessert course. Um, we obviously both had this course, but we had different options. I could choose between a creme brulee, the yuzu sorbet that you got, and then um, Mona, Monaka Daifuku, which is actually what I got. I just <laughs> did not know what it was called. Um, and then you had the option of the yuzu sorbet and a plant-based version of the Minaka Daifuku. Yep. So, you first. How was your plant-based? You got yuzu sorbet? I want to tell you. you it's like as yuzu if man? it's like they listened to me in the kitchen and real time adapted this menu Went to back things in that time I was saying and changed because the menu. Quincy, I don't think the part I think the part you're not remembering is the fact that yes, I had this bowl of really interesting yuzu sorbet which was not like your conventional mixed sorbet that's then scooped. They had somehow texturized this and it, made it like almost like a bed of rocks. Yeah, it was like pellety in a <laughs> it good way. Was it, it was looked sort of like, really pretty. Sort of like dip and dots. It looks like but snow. like you know, like that you bought at a farmer's market. And then on the side, they had these little discs, two different shapes like one was a dome, one was like more flat it was like but a also disc. a dome disc is the right disc word. Yeah. it was a disc and yeah. the other was a like dome a like a half it's yeah a dome deep. the yuba roll okay the shiso is back the floral herb that that i asked about and our server went in the kitchen to find out what it was okay this herb is used as the as the flavoring for these gelatinous flavor shapes that you then scoop up. Okay, I ate one. I ate some by itself, and I would say it's it, it was it had kind of the flavor of fresh cut grass. Oh, and around the edge there was rose sugar. Rose sugar. Did sugar you have rose, rose sugar? Did you have rose sugar too? No, not on mine. Oh, I had it in the plant base. Excuse me, I'm sorry. My dessert was the Monaka Daifuku with ice cream and Kinako crumble. Now this is another one I asked for the waitress's opinion on because I knew that he was gonna get the yuzu sorbet. So I was between the other two, the creme brulee and this. And I asked our server, you know, what should I get? And she said the Monaka Daifuku is a very traditional Japanese dessert, that it was something that was more authentic. And she also explained, like she basically said that it came with mochi, which I love mochi. So this sold me before she finished talking. She told me it came with mochi and rice crackers and then you can put them together and make a little sandwich. And I was like that, I wanna do that. I wanna be that person at the end of this meal. There was also vanilla ice cream on top of that kinako crumble and then a couple like strawberries and sliced grapes that looked like olives, but they were grapes. I started with the mochi and the rice crackers which this was a very good mochi. You could tell it was made in house. It was the perfect balance of the like rice dough on the outside and the red bean paste inside. Sweet, but not too sweet, super squishy and gooey. And then it had this rice crack on the outside, which had the texture of a very, very thin rice cake from the grocery store with like very little flavor to it. But what that did was make it the perfect textural complement to this gooey, gooey mochi. Final thoughts about this restaurant. Of our three now fine dining experiences that we've done, all videos that you can check out, Victorian Alberts, Monsieur Paul, and now this at Takumi Te. Takumi Te was my favorite Pretty much a runaway it was my favorite yeah i loved it loved it loved it loved it it's not for picky eaters it's not for people who don't want to spend three to four hours of their epcot park day in a restaurant and it's not for people who aren't looking to splurge because it was 250 dollars for my seat all in with our with the cocktail and with tip we were up near 500 dollars tonight so it's a 
very expensive meal. It is fine dining, a luxury experience, perhaps once in a lifetime for a lot of people. Um, and I don't want to take that lightly, especially if you are a picky eater, this is not your me the meal for you. What's your takeaway from it? Absolutely my favorite of the fine dining uh, experiences that we've uh, shared together. And um, I think it's a, a, a total destination for plant-based eaters. Uh, if you are somebody who loves Japanese food and feel like you don't have a place uh, in the in the landscape of restaurants um, because you are a plant-based eater uh, I feel th like this is a place that welcomes us and uh, works very hard to create dishes that are unique and inspired and not just something to feed us because you know that's the thing to do now is to make a plant-based menu this is the first time that I have gone to a restaurant for work that I had maybe not considered going to before that I 100% am saying that I will be saving the money to go back to Takumi Te. It was that good. And I, I don't even care if the menu changes. I would go back to that exact same menu. I would go back for a change to the menu. I would go back, period. Yeah. The service was amazing. The atmosphere yeah. is spectacular. Yeah. You go in and they explain that the, there are five different rooms. Um, with all inspired by these elements and every room is gorgeous there are no windows and you're like that's gonna be stuffy it's not it feels like an oasis in the middle of Epcot you feel transported to another world Takumi Te means house of art house of the artisan and that's what the atmosphere feels like it's what the food craftsmanship feels like if you like this video go ahead and like and subscribe and now go watch us review Monsieur Paul in Epcot <laughs> we'll see you there au revoir au revoir arigato, arigato.